I can tell you, just being here at Marshall, listening to the security experts from the Nordic countries, listening to the security experts from the Baltic countries, the fear there that Russia might move some other place besides, uh, you know, outside its borders is, is real. You're listening to Conversations, the official podcast of the George C. Marshall European Center for Security Studies, recorded at the center in Garmisch, Germany. Welcome to another Marshall Center Conversations podcast. I'm Jim Brooks, Public Affairs Director. The voice you heard at the beginning of this podcast was Mead Treadwell, the former Lieutenant Governor of Alaska. He was a recent guest speaker at a workshop we had here February 6th and 7th, 2017. Now, this two-day workshop was attended by our faculty, as well as military, academic, and government experts from Nordic and Baltic countries, the United States, Germany and Canada, all who specialize in the Arctic. The group also took a hard look at the emerging security challenges and the economic opportunities caused by the changing climate and advances in technology. Mead Treadwell was the workshop's opening speaker with both political and private sector experience with the polar region. He certainly knows what's going on in the Arctic today. If you're wondering why we had this workshop, The lessons and recommendations learned over those two days will be integrated into future programs here and quite possibly in a separate resident program. Here is our interview between Treadwell and Professor Joe Van, our program director for Countering Transnational Organized Crime. And I'd like to start with uh, when you look at your history of moving from Connecticut to Alaska, no one would realize that you're not Alaskan. It's almost as if you have Alaska in your DNA. But when you first arrived in Alaska, you uh, happened upon the Exxon Valdez oil spill. Huge challenge on the uh, recovery part of that uh, effort. And one of the comments I read that you made was that it will be generations before we know the true extent of the damage of the oil spill and impact on the ecology. When you talk about developing the Arctic, and making opportunities for business. We always have to keep in balance the other side that wants to worry or focus on conservation. How do you, as a leader, put that into perspective for people? Sure. Well, thank you. I I actually came up to Alaska in 1974, so it was a few years before Exxon Valdez, but I came up because I was on a family fishing trip. Uh, Our family didn't have wealth, but uh, we loved to, you know, just go out west to fish, and the year I got out of high school, the icing on the cake of those western trips was a trip to Alaska. Um, I got to know Prince William Sound. Prince William Sound is this spectacular water body uh, kind of uh, to, to the southeast of Anchorage and uh, in near, you know, includes Valdez and Cordova and Whittier, the three big communities in there. There's the Tetlik and Chenega, which are two native communities. A million nooks and crannies that are fun to explore in a kayak or a a uh, small boat or even a you know a large cruise ship and uh when in 1989 Exxon Valdez hit the rocks i had already helped establish some marine parks in Prince William Sound i was working for a natural gas pipeline company and uh actually the company we sold to was buying me out so i left the company and went to volunteer at the uh, actually i i was paid but i i took a job at uh, Cordova, the city of Cordova, where most of the fishermen were put out of business. Uh, there's a guy named Bill Walker, who's now governor of Alaska, who was the lawyer for the city of Valdez. Uh, there was a group of us who said, okay, we know the world needs energy. We know that oil is going to ship by tanker. We know that uh, this happened because of complacency, and we had to set up the right kind of rules, the right kind of organizations, the right kind of Uh, never forget type uh, approach uh, to make sure that it uh, doesn't happen again. We've been very successful, but I I went from working for that community, lobbying on behalf of a town full of angry fishermen uh, with the Congress, to being named Deputy Commissioner of Environment in Alaska by Governor Hickel, uh, writing the regulations on that and helping the federal government write their regulations. And then later on, just... I, you know, I'll, I'll put it this way. I am very bullish on energy development. The, you know, the, the Arctic is a great, secure source of energy, and we can do it properly. But I am bearish on oil spills, and I'm just a, you know, very insistent 
that we continue to improve our capability as we move, uh, as we move energy around the world. And so you're comfortable that there are technological solutions that will mitigate the environmental uh, threats? I believe you have to work them. And, uh, you know, double hulls on tankers has made a big difference over time. Um, the storm chokes have made a big difference. Uh, I think we unfortunately learned a whole lot. I was at the White House four days after the big Gulf spill. I was chair of the US Arctic Research Commission. And, uh, uh, and so I think it's, a, you know, it's very important that we continue to press research and development. Um, the other thing that we learned during Exxon Valdez is you want to have a good ecological baseline to understand what's there because it helps you kind of repair the damage later on. But the most important thing I think I remembered with Exxon Valdez, and this has to do with a lot of different things, in security, uh, in, in community policing, if they, I know you have a law enforcement background, is the last time you want to meet somebody for the first time is 2 o'clock in the morning when, you're oil, when your tanker has hit the rocks. We have worked to bring the shippers of oil through our communities uh, in to, to get to know the mayors, the city council, the people who have that. And because if you don't establish trust before an incident, you're never going to get it. And uh, that makes it a whole lot harder to clean up and a whole lot harder to get the kind of uh, uh, action that you need to get. Wow. <laughs> a lot to think about there. Yeah. If we turn a little bit towards the Arctic uh, as far as a, a development opportunity on a wider scale, we have to keep in mind it, huge infrastructure requirements. And we see from a, a lot of interviews with the local people, the indigenous uh, people, that they really want the infrastructure developed in the right way. Do you have any visions of how the infrastructure can be developed that is smart and doesn't uh, degrade the ecology? Yeah, yeah. In fact, it, it, it's very interesting. Technology is making some of this uh, a, a whole lot easier, a whole lot better. When, uh, when I take a look at rural Alaska, rural Alaska has 200 communities off the road system. That means they're also off the electric power grid. It means the only way to get to that town is probably through a small airstrip or water in the, in, in the summer, maybe a snow machine or a dog sled, and people still do use dog sleds in the, in, in, in the winter. And so you've got these communities, and people are there because historically it's been a community or it's a good place for subsistence hunting or fishing or that sort of thing. But believe it or not, of those 200 communities, still 35% of them or so don't have flush plumbing, flush water. So we are working with the Native Tribal Health Organization. I started that in the 90s, uh, that relationship, so that we have much more, you know, the basic infrastructure that people, people need running water. The health impacts of not having running water are extraordinary. Uh, electric power. We have invested a huge amount in wind diesel and electric power in the Arctic, and I've, I just saw a chart of similar challenges in Russia, Canada, northern Greenland, where, or, and, and, and Greenland, where right now people are hauling in diesel to, 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 at a very expensive rate. I mean, you know, we're used to, in kind of the developed world, of paying maybe 7 to 14 cents a kilowatt hour for electric power. Uh, there in rural Alaska, Think of the cost as being 50 or 60 cents, uh, depending on what the oil price is. And so we've replaced a lot of that diesel fuel with wind power. And we're working to do it with some other things, into, including uh, run of river uh, generators and that sort of thing. And this is one place where cooperation in the Arctic, there's an Arctic Energy Summit uh, happening again this spring, um, it can, can really help cross-pollinate. And what we've learned about microgrids it's going to be helpful in Africa. It's going to be helpful in a lot of developing parts of the world that still don't have electric power. So you see what you're experiencing in Alaska is actually being uh, kind of a leading edge for development in the rest of the Arctic region. You know, we always have been. I, I love to say that uh, we've, uh, the Arctic makes you an innovator. You know, sunglasses happened in the Arctic before they happened in any other place. The snow was too bright. So people deliver these, these uh, slot goggles, slit, uh, slit goggles. Uh, trampolines uh, had never been seen any place else before uh, Alaska Natives did the blanket toss. The kayak, of course, was made there. And w we have to work on innovations in energy and health and telecommunications. The, we were really the first adopters of v VSATs uh, to, to bring uh, better telecommunications to many rural villages. We're an early adopter on, uh, you know, a big adopter on uh, low-Earth orbiting systems like 
uh, iridium, which I advise. So there's, there's a, a lot that we can do in the developed country parts of the Arctic to solve problems that will help people in developing countries all over the world. And those, that requires a lot of investment. From your perspective, who should be investing in the Arctic? And how does that relate to Arctic security, both for the U.S. and other countries? Well, one of the things that is fairly dramatic that has happened in the Arctic, you know, in, in the last generation, you know, I mean, all of us know the stories of decolonization in Africa, decolonization in, in Asia. Uh, what most people don't realize is that Iceland became independent from Denmark during World War II. Uh, Alaska, of course, was purchased from Russia 150 years ago, uh, but it only became a state in 1959. Uh, we got, with statehood, control of about a th 103 million acres of our land, and then the Alaska Native community got another 44 million acres. So we got about 365 million acres. So somewhere a little bit less than half our land is controlled by the people who live there. Uh, the Yukon Territory just got control of its land. The Northwest Territory did. The new territory in Canada, none of it is getting set up. So the one thing about all this self-determination is that if an oil well gets drilled, we get one-eighth of, of the revenue that comes out of that oil well. And that's why we have that big permanent fund. And that money has allowed us to put some basic infrastructure in place where we couldn't before. I mean, you know, the flush plumbing example that you have. The other thing is that all of us, whether it's in Russia, Alaska, Canada, Greenland, uh, are calling on national governments to, to also make investments to help bring us up to speed. People may say, why do you need to build a railroad? Well, you know, not all the railroads were built in the 1870s. They, we still need to build some railroads. We still need to build some roads. We still need to build ports. I mean, the Bering Sea coast is as long as from Maine to Florida, Maine to Key West, all right? And we do not have a single deep water port uh, that's developed on the western side of Alaska. And as more and more shipping is about to go through the Arctic, I think that's a national responsibility as well as a local responsibility. And uh, frankly, I'm helping to develop a public-private partnership between the state of Alaska, the Coast Guard, the Corps of Engineers, and Alaska Native Corporation to see some of these ports built. Wow. What about from a geo political perspective. You spent a lot of time in Russia, uh, as we've been discussing in our Arctic security workshop. Yeah. Uh, there's concerns dealing with Russia. What are your concerns based on your personal interactions and work in Russia? And how do you see Russia in the uh, context of Arctic security? Friend, foe, troublemaker, partner, what would be your, uh, your thoughts on that? And how would you advise if you were invited to Congress to uh, give your thoughts? Well, uh, thanks, thanks for that question. You know, um, if I go to my grave tomorrow, one of the things that I hope uh, uh, my kids remember Dad did is I was on that first flight at the end of the Cold War where we opened the border between Alaska and Russia. And I'll tell you, um, there were Alaska uh, natives who had cousins um, that they hadn't seen for 30 years because communism had built this ice wall, so to speak, uh, between us. And since that border opened in 1988, we've had at the University of Alaska more Russian students than, than any other university in the country there for a period of time. Uh, I know a lot of people who were born in Russia who live in Alaska who have kids uh, and families on both sides. And so the fact that we're close, it, it really is personally close. Uh, people don't understand, you know, there's a joke about I can see Russia from my house. Uh, the, the, the fact is my house was in Russia 150 years ago. Um, so personally, I think most people who think about ge the big geopolitics forget the fact that we are neighbors, all right? Now, how well is our neighbor behaving in the neighborhood? Uh, on a lot of the issues of doing things right in the Arctic, there's a lot of cooperation. We, ha we cooperate on, on you know, law enforcement with fishing, for example. Um, we have a search and rescue agreement in the Arctic. We have an oil spill agreement in the Arctic. Uh, we both have many of the same aspirations to sell energy to the south, to put in the pipeline infrastructure or the liquefied natural gas or so forth. And so that's fascinating to me as an Alaskan, to go over to Russia and to see what they're doing and how they're thinking about that and so forth. And then you get this huge problem with Russia as a bad actor in the world when it comes to Crimea, Georgia, Ukraine, that has just put a chilling effect back on uh, construction uh, in a cooperation in the Arctic. 
we still have a very good relationship in the Arctic Council, but I can tell you, just being here at Marshall, listening to the security experts from the Nordic countries, listening to the security experts from the Baltic countries, the fear there that Russia might move some other place besides, uh, you know, outside its borders is, is real. And that has colored the whole discussion of how, what kind of cooperation we can have in the Arctic. So for me, here's what I think we have to do. I honestly think that we have to let Mr. Putin know that, that you, you just don't take other people's ground. You know, and we have told him that with the sanctions and so forth, but we can't give up on that. At the same time, there's plenty of room for cooperation in this brand new ocean, but we've got to go in there with our own independent capability. That's why I've pushed the United States to build icebreakers. That's why uh, I'm now chairing a, a, a task force for the Arctic Circle on shipping and ports, and there are Russians involved with it, where we want to make sure that there's a seaway up there. And you know, I'll just tell you, when the sanctions went on, uh, you know, one of the questions was, are we still going to be able to fly over Russia? If I fly from uh, Japan to London, which I did last week, uh, most of my trip is over Russia. It used to be you had to fly all the way to Alaska and then across the Arctic Ocean. Uh, and, the f and the fact is, is Russia is now integrated into some of our uh, global infrastructure, and I think they should be integrated into more of it. And, and you know, ultimately... We need to have Russia as a, as a peaceful player in the Arctic and the world, and I, I pray that there's ways we're going to get there because the Russian people we know, uh, they're, they're friends, and, and you know, uh, uh, the aspirations that they have in the parts of the north are very similar to ours. I work with the Russian governors on that, and it's just very, very hard for me as an American to understand why those good people uh, would be part of a government that, that would be just you know, acting in a way that that is is causing huge you know, a huge lack of stability around the world. Yeah, it's uh, well, we hope things will settle down. Uh, turning to China, China mm -hmm. stands to benefit uh, greatly from open uh, passages through the Arctic. What do you see in the future, 10, 20, 30 years out, regarding China? Are there opportunities uh, that we need to? A look at taking advantage of, and you know, how do you see China play into the region? Sure. In the early 90s, we created the Arctic Council. It's eight Arctic nations together. Um, there were a few observer organizations and a couple of observer states, but recently the Arctic Council added China, Korea, Japan, Singapore, India, uh, as well as some other European countries as observers. And, you know, uh, the question when you have an observer, the, you know, you have the inner ring, which are the foreign ministers, and the outer ring are people who, who observe. But here's, here's my point. The Asian countries especially are our partners in the Arctic. If we're going to, you know, finance a pipeline or a port or a shipping system, it's going to be uh, to the benefit of, of the Asian countries. You know, when I go to get money for an icebreaker in Congress... I'm also arguing that we ought to have a tariff because why should American taxpayers necessarily pay so China can sell goods to France? And we've got to have a commercial system that works with that to get the infrastructure. And so I'm very delighted that when Prime Minister Abe comes to the United States uh, on the 10th, he's, he said he wants to talk about investment in American infrastructure to help get jobs. And the kind of investment in infrastructure may help energy for Japan, energy security for Japan, but it's also going to help us develop our part of the country safely. China. Um, China's a major investor right now in some of our major mines, um, uh, in some of the oil fields. Uh, we're watching carefully what they're doing in shipping. And I believe that if China remains a, uh, a, a trading partner rather than a military rival in the Arctic, uh, it's, it's, it will be positive. Great. What about just the Arctic uh, Council? Do you think it's a, a better idea to have more observers than less, or do you think we're at the right level now? Well, the, big, the biggest unanswered question in the Arctic Council is the European Union. And the European Union has taken certain legislative positions that are d disastrous for people who live in the Arctic. Now, I, you know, I would never take a a seal or hunt a bear or hunt a moose or fish uh, and, uh, and be poaching. But if, the, if, if these areas are opening for hunting and they're protecting the, you know, the population levels of the species, 
then why is Europe saying that, that you can't import seal oil, for example? Seal oil is, is very good for your veins, you know? Why is it that the U.S. is saying you can't bring in ivory from a, you know, uh, that is carved by a Canadian citizen? So you have this political correctness, which is well-founded. People want to protect species. But where we still manage these species uh, and put people to work, um, you know, you want to have that. So that's been one of the burrs under the saddle that has kept uh, the European Union out of this. And, and so ultimately, maybe there should be a dialogue on that. Uh, but all told... I think we've got a very good group of observers right now, and the one condition the Arctic Council made on getting these observers is you can't just be there because you want to be there. It's, uh, it's not like a bunch of nations set up these small science shops in Antarctica just in case Antarctica you know, came down to being national claims. What these countries have come in is they've come in as an investors in the Arctic. They've come in in ways working with the indigenous groups. They've come in ways helping us improve education and infrastructure. And that's positive, and that rule is out there still. If you, if you're, you know, I'll take a country in South Africa. It probably doesn't have a whole lot of work to do in the Arctic. But if they decided they wanted to be uh, an Arctic Council observer, there's a series of steps to take to make sure that you're working with Arctic people, and that's a good thing. Great. So overall, positive on the outlook of the Arctic. Uh, I am bullish about the Arctic. You know, I, the PT Capital, where I. Uh, where I work is a private equity fund that's investing in Arctic countries. Um, these Arctic countries or the Arctic parts of these countries are actually growing faster than the countries themselves. We've seen about a 6% growth rate, 5.8% over the last 15 years, whether oil prices have been high or low. Uh, and people ask, well, what are you investing in? And let me just tell you what we do in the Arctic. We help feed the world. We've got two of the most productive fisheries, uh, the Barents Sea near Norway and Iceland, uh, and the Bering Sea uh, between Alaska and Russia. Uh, we help fuel the world. And the energy that we produce, the largest uh, uh, source of natural gas for Asia, is going to be coming out of Russia by the end of this year. Uh, we're the, we were at times the largest source of crude oil for North America. Um, there's, there's tremendous opportunity in fuel, both in renewables and in conventional fuels. We help provision the world. We've got the largest lead zinc mine in the world, the largest iron ore mine in the world going into production, the, uh, the largest nickel mine in the world. There's, there's a lot of use of our resources in things people use every day, like their cell phones. Uh, we, help to, uh, we help connect the world. Uh, uh, over 10,000 people a day fly across the Arctic. If, they, if you're flying from Detroit to Shanghai, you're spending most of your trip in the Arctic. If you're flying from Los Angeles to London, most of your trip's in the Arctic. And uh, we help connect the world with aviation now. It's going to be shipping later. Uh, we help protect the world. If you take a look at the big air bases, uh, radar sites that we've got in places like Greenland and the missile defense site in Alaska, that's, that is responsible for keeping 750 million people out of nuclear annihilation. And finally, I think we inspire the world. Come up and see the Diderot dog sled race. Come experience our native culture. Experience this fantastic beauty. And those are the things that we do. And every single one of them, we want to do more. The economy's growing. I'm bullish on the Arctic, and I think we're doing good things for the world. That's great. Thank you. I wanted to ask you one quick uh, final question sure. concerning the Marshall Center. Your experience here, was it positive, and do you think our focus on the Arctic is well-placed? I think it's absolutely essential. Uh, let me just say this. I have followed the work of the Marshall Center for some time. I obviously worked on some defense issues in Alaska and there's a companion center uh, in Hawaii called the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies. And I've always wondered, why isn't the Marshall Center paying more attention to the Arctic? Because the European command is, is uh, kind of where the Arctic military decisions are made. And by gosh, you, have this, you had the seminar this week. It may uh, turn into a longer-term course. I really wish you Godspeed. And uh, what uh, impressed me most is the caliber of the people who put the program together and the caliber of people you brought in, to, uh, you, you attracted from around the world on this. Uh, this is very, very important tool of American foreign policy of German and a great partnership with Germany. Uh, honored to be here. Well, great. Thank you for coming. Thank you for making us smarter and all the best in the future. Good luck. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye. That was an interview between Mead Treadwell and our professor Joe Van on security in the Arctic region recorded on February 7th. 2017. For more news about the Marshall Center, 
visit us online at marshallcenter.org. Don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to Conversations, the official podcast of the George C. Marshall European Center for Security Studies. The opinions and views expressed here are not necessarily those of the Marshall Center, the Department of Defense, the German Ministry of Defense, or any other entity affiliated with the Marshall Center. More from the Marshall Center is available on Twitter, Facebook, and other social media channels, and at www.marshallcenter.org. Thanks for listening.